What's up guys, my name is Ed, but if you didn't know that, then what are you doing here? Go check out part one of the build first. Go on. I'll be here when you get back. For the rest of you, thank you so much for coming back. You know why you're here already, so let's get straight into it. I opted to go with a pair of smaller doors that would double as the desktop. The bottom doors would open downwards to create the desk surface, and the top doors would flip up. To have the doors open downwards into a desk, I used these drop-down hinges. Installing this style of hinge can be a bit stressful. You essentially just have one shot. You only get one shot. Also, I wouldn't recommend the hinges that I bought specifically, and you'll see why later on in the video. Because the Besta cabinet bottom is much thicker than the doors, I had to drill further down into the cabinet to lower the hinge to ensure that the door was properly aligned when closed. Drilling holes with my Forstner bits by hand was not feasible at all and I don't have space for a drill press so I got this portable drill guide on Amazon and it definitely saved the day. And it was definitely interesting to see the material IKEA uses to laminate the door. People are plastic. I, I don't know. All that was left was to secure the hinge in place with screws and to do a test run, which looked good for now. For for the top doors, I wanted some flip-up style action and decided to try out these IKEA Utrusta hinges. These hinges are actually made by Bloom, which is a well-regarded company that manufactures a variety of furniture fittings. People complain about IKEA's instructions, but come on, that's straight up solid advice. Tip of the day, don't smash your face. Installation of the hinge itself is pretty straightforward. You screw it into the cabinet in the top corner. For the door, the kit comes with a template for where you're supposed to mount the attaching clip. Because the dimensions of the best are different than IKEA's kitchen cabinets, if you use a template as is, you'll end up with a door that closes too low. All that was needed to fix this was to adjust the mounting point down by the distance the door was off by. All that was left was to install the trim piece, which made me realize how tight a fit these hinges were and how lucky I was to actually get them to work. <laughs> Just had to make sure to get under this part here to get the trim to fit. For the monitor mounts, I went with these articulating mounts for their compactness as well as their price. In my last video, I installed a reinforcing backing to the Besta specifically for these mounts. This is about where I realized I didn't take into account the fact that the monitors aren't centered on the mount and that I'd have to adjust the backings. Some All that work for an inch. On this team, we fight for that itch. Thanks for the pep talk, and now it's time to finish off and make sure we're all good. And the monitor fits nice and snug. Now to collect the spoils of war. I'm not the only one that does this, right? This thing's actually pretty cool. It's magnetic and can turn basically anything it sticks to into a level. To make the front cover for the cabinet, I started off by cutting some quarter inch hardboard down to size, then roughly drew out my design. For the decorative trim, I cut some two and a half inch MDF down the middle, then cut these strips down to size on my miter saw. Then it was just a matter of piecing together the puzzle. To attach everything together, I roughly sanded everything down and used a combination of wood glue and super glue to act as a clamping force. I decided to keep the prime side down for a more consistent look since only one side was rounded after I cut the pieces down in half. I filled in all the gaps and joints as best I could with some wood filler, then it was time to get everything ready to paint. I prepped all the pieces by first giving them a good sanding, making sure to round off any sharp edges in the process. For this frame, I covered up a couple of the pocket holes with these pocket hole plugs. They really do a good job of hiding the fact that pocket holes were used. I'm using this Zinsser Bin Shellac based primer, which is supposed to be really good at sealing MDF and hardboard. For this front trim piece, I decided to use the spray version of the Zinsser Bin Shellac primer, which in hindsight was a bad move. I thought I was clever because it would be easier to get into the nooks and crannies with the spray, but it had a major downside. I went ahead and started spraying a few coats down, I then moved on to paint, and this is where I started noticing that it wasn't looking so hot. When I took a closer look, I saw a speckled mess. Turns out I got shellac. <laughs> I'm not sure if I had bad technique or if it was a defective can, but I sanded down the flakes and you can see exactly where the shellac clumps came off. But at least I didn't have to make the whole thing again. I guess. I painted the rest of the pieces and brought everything inside. For the outer frame that was already attached to the wall, I only painted the areas that would be visible. Don't be lazy when masking things off you didn't want painted. Sometimes laziness brings out the best in creativity though, and I decided to use some whiteout correction tape to fix. Good enough. I then attached the hardboard side panels with glue and brad nails. 
For the front panel, I wanted to be able to take it off easily just in case I needed to access the internal electronics. So I decided to use magnets. These particular magnets seem to have a holding capacity of around five pounds each, as long as you don't pull too quickly. The front panel weighs around 10 pounds total and I decided to use five magnets, one in each corner and one in the center. Since I used quarter inch hardboard for the panel, the screws that came with the magnets would be too long and end up going through the front. So instead I decided to use super glue to attach the steel pieces to the back. I used this Gorilla brand glue that has both a nozzle and a brush, the latter of which helped a ton with this application. The five magnets were able to hold the panel alone with no issues, and with this bottom piece supporting more weight, I was totally satisfied with the results. Another bonus was this satisfying snap. Just like the satisfying snaps of hitting those like, subscribe, and bell icons below. So be sure to do that if you're enjoying the content and to be notified when I post part three of this series or any other videos. I also used magnets for the inner frame cover panel, which was installed with absolutely no issues. Now onto the part that I was kind of dreading, getting the best of unit secured onto the linear rails. Now I had to figure out a way to blindly determine exactly where to drill the holes to attach the four blocks that hook onto the railing. Ideally, I could put something in the holes to mark the spots, but I didn't have anything on hand that fit snug that could also mark the Besta. My first idea was to use some double-sided tape to mark where the holes were and hopefully transfer that. Two out of four transferred, not good enough. My next try was to mark the holes with some spackle that would transfer to the cabinet, but that was a miss as well as it wasn't nearly precise enough, and I probably should have removed that tape first. After a bunch of tries and racking my brain to see if I had anything I could plug into the holes for an accurate marking, I remembered I had a 3D printer and I could make my own. I wiped my tears away of the time wasted and designed these pegs in Tinkercad, then printed them off. The pegs have a bit of a point at the end to make the indent and perfectly fit into the holes. I did one last cabinet deadlift and... I drilled out the holes with the help of my drill guide and decided it was time for an LED break because how could I not? I'm using individually addressable LED strips from BTF Lighting. Individually addressable means you can control each LED independently from the others, which can make for some really cool effects. At this point, I needed to cut the LED strip, which for this strip you can do at any of the points with the three copper pads. To be able to hook these up later, I could hose in the back of the Besta with a half inch spade bit to pass the wires through. For the cut side, I soldered a three wire ribbon cable just in case I wanted to hook up the rest of those lights later. Probably the most uncomfortable soldering I've done, but it's a success. <laughs> I went ahead and mounted the best of the linear rails. Not completely flawlessly, but at least 85%. At this point, I went ahead and attached the doors for a test fit. For the left cabinet, I used the standard side opening hinge, but not the IKEA Besta branded ones for a couple of reasons. Firstly, I needed a more restricted hinge for the space so that I don't hit the walls when opening. Secondly, the last Besta hinges I used were straight up junk. The soft close mechanism failed and the hinges leaked out this hydraulic fluid and stained my doors. The only thing I had to do differently was drill new holes to screw the hinges to the doors, but everything else installed the same as the IKEA hardware otherwise. Early on in the video, I mentioned that I didn't recommend these specific hinges I bought, and this is the reason why. When opened, they don't stop at 180 degrees, but instead go a little bit further, which obviously didn't work for me as I was looking to distribute the load of the desktop as much as possible. So I went to Home Depot and picked up these similar hinges. They definitely lock at 180 degrees, but of course it wouldn't be so easy. They're significantly smaller than the hinges I already installed and the holes I already cut. I figured I'd give them a shot anyway, but predictably, it wouldn't work without some major modifications. So I took a closer look at the original hinges and it looks like the flaws with this pin that allows for too much travel. If I jam something in there to restrict the movement, I could hopefully get the hinge to stop at 180 degrees. And jam something in I did. Once again, it was the 3D printer to the rescue. After what felt like was the most intense game of operation I've had in my life, we had something I could work with. Before I reinstalled the hinges, I used some wood filler to strengthen the chipboard doors from all the installing and reinstalling that I'd done previously. For a stronger fix, I'd recommend going with epoxy putty, but do as I say, not as I do, right? I then added some gas springs that would provide for a soft opening as well as additional support for the desktop. It's not the strongest platform ever, but should be able to handle general office work with no problems. The next step was to join the doors together so that they could open as one and to also cover up the factory drilled holes. 
Once again, my 3D printer came to the rescue. I used a router to trim the doors down. Some edges worked well and others not so much. No problem, just need a wider 3D printed design. I scuffed up the surfaces a little, then used some construction adhesive to hold things together. When all was said and done, it actually turned out sturdier than I expected. For the outer portion of the desktop, I used a router to cut out a channel on the right panel to accommodate for wiring of the actuator controls. I also incorporated the existing hinge holes of the door into my 3D printed designs to make for a snug fit, then used some super glue to hold it down. I had to print these panels in two separate pieces because my 3D printer isn't big enough to do it in one. To connect the pieces together, I used a 3D printed spacer, then outlined where I would join the two doors with these stainless steel plates. I then used a router to carve out sections so that the plates could sit flush. For more robust connection, I used T-nuts to secure the plates with machine screws, which I also reinforced with super glue. I then used construction adhesive to hold everything together. To hide all of that when viewing from the front, I used the 3D printed spacers, which I also secured with construction adhesive. I was pretty happy with the results, so I went ahead and reattached the door. And that's where we'll wrap things up for this video. We're in the end game now, but there's still a ton of stuff to do, so be sure to check out part three, which will conclude this multi-project project. As always, I'll link everything I use in the description down below, good or bad. Bad is kind of a PSA to not buy those items. Some of those links will be affiliate links, so clicking through and making any purchase would be absolutely appreciated. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and do all the things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.